And so, Michael, we welcome you to the pulpit of the First Presbyterian Church of Delray Beach. I wear this cosmetically just for aesthetics. See, it's better with it on. Paige, my wife, insists that when we're home alone, I still wear a mask and observe social distancing. (laughs) It is just such a delight to be here with you uh, and to see parts of faces, some of which are actually familiar. There are some of the folks that we see in the mountains in the summers. Uh, There's some New York people here, back there, uh, and uh, more back there. (laughs) Great. Uh, It is just such a delight. And and to be with uh, Doug and Grace, uh, who are such good friends, it's been special to Paige and me. Uh, We had dinner with them and uh, Dr. Jansen last night. It was it was just such a special time. Thank you for that. And then this morning, Doug and Greg and I had breakfast. I haven't gone short of food here. Um, and I was mentioning to some other folks that uh, one of the things I like, we like so much about Delray Beach. Yesterday we, we sat out on, on the, the sand and got our feet in the water and and just breathed in this wonderful air and we're so grateful for this. And and then when you go out to eat in Delray Beach, uh, apparently uh, your restaurants think that the persons who come in haven't eaten in weeks. Uh, we were at a, a, an Italian restaurant Friday night, and they brought this food that I had ordered, and, uh, and I, I felt uh, sorry, really, that I had not invited the offensive line of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to share it's this plate of stuff, and I said, this is good. This is my kind of a community. Thank you for letting us be here. Thank you so much. Um, I mentioned at the early service, I don't, I don't know if you remember the last time we were here. This is our third occasion. The last time we were here, uh, we left, we went back home, and um, a month later, the world shut down with the COVID pandemic. So the last time I was here, we started COVID. Uh, don't know what we'll set in motion this time. I'm sure you're excited to find out what's going to happen once Paige and I leave town, but uh, good luck. Thanks for the music. The, the music is just extraordinary. The singers, the, everything, and, and I'm, I'm grateful you ministered to me today. Thank you for being here. Let me share with you um, three brief verses from Hebrews 12, very familiar verses, and I'm going to read to you from the Revised Standard. I think this is probably NIV in in the bulletin. Read along. It's very, very similar language, but uh, so writes the author of Hebrews. We have no clue who that person was. You hear people say, as Paul wrote in Hebrews, well, we know one thing. Paul did not write Hebrews. We don't know who did. It wasn't Paul, but somebody did, and whoever it was, they're really worth reading. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. For this church, for this moment, for these lessons from your written word, 
for this time when you will come again and be in our midst. Oh God, we are thankful. Say to us what you would have us hear. And don't let me get in the way. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. For the next few minutes, I'd like for you to take the letter P, so you're going to do that backwards, P, and hang it in your head, because we're going to uh, connect just a little handful of letters to it as we move forward. When we returned to North Carolina after 10 absolutely wonderful years in New York, uh, I was out of work for about six weeks, uh, after which Paige said, you've got to go somewhere. Uh, but I felt this, you know, this need. I wasn't through with ministry. And so primarily since that point in time, uh, I've been teaching. I, I preach as often as I can. Whenever I'm invited, I come. This is wonderful. And four months a year uh, in a, a tourist community in the mountains of North Carolina, I have the privilege of on Sunday mornings preaching to the folks there. But for most of the time, I teach uh, biblical studies and church history at High Point University and a little bit uh, uh, in, in preaching at Duke Divinity School. About a month before he died, uh, Dr. Mickey Eford, who was one of the premier biblical scholars of the 20th century, uh, made a remark to me tongue in cheek. We were talking about some of the responses you get on tests back from your students. And he said, Michael, the things our students can teach us if we pay attention. And uh, we had talked before about some of the things that show up. For example, I always try to make tests passable. I want, I want the students to learn, but I don't want it to be a backbreaker. So I try to come up with questions that give them every possibility of getting them right. This semester, uh, I ask them a test. According to the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, who was Jesus' father? That's not too tough. You got two chances on that one. The, the answer I was looking for is Joseph. But if you can't come up with that, you could just put God, you know, son of God. I would have accepted either one. So I figured there's no way anybody is going to miss this. I'm grading the papers, get to one, and it says, according to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, who was Jesus' father? Moses. 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 Another one. <laughs> I had uh, asked who was the most famous zealot in the New Testament. Well, we don't know, but two. One is Simon the Zealot and one is Judas. We know virtually nothing about Simon the Zealot and we know more about Judas. There's only one answer. Only one answer. Who is the most famous zealot in the New Testament? Judas. I'm going through my test. There it is. Who is the most famous zealot in the New Testament? King David. Well, at what point have you ever heard anyone on this planet <laughs> say that King David is a New Testament character? I, I had one in a term paper. I thought this was a joke. I really, seriously, sincerely thought this is the punchline to a joke, which I had read before as the punchline to a joke. I thought it was make-believe. And then... In a paper, a student referred to Pontius the Pilot. <laughs> like he worked for Southwest Airlines. Another one I had, I had referred in a lecture to parousia, Greek word. Whenever you, uh, in the New Testament, you read second coming, chances are you're, you're looking at the Greek word parousia. That's what it means, second coming. So... I tried to do it in a way they could understand. I got a, a midterm paper back from a student who said, when Jesus returns, it will be for the Parisians. I went home, I said, Paige, when Jesus comes back, he's going to Paris. <laughs> who knew? Good choice, but... <clears throat> so the things we can learn from our students, not too long ago, I was lecturing one day, primarily on the doctrine of incarnation, the word becoming flesh. At the close of the class, this young man, tall, handsome, athletic, fraternity guy, popular, um, came up to me after, this, after the class was over. He said, uh, 
doc, which is what he calls me because I think even at this point in the semester, he hasn't learned my name. Uh, doc, enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. It's interesting. Thank you. I like your stories. Great. Then he said, but you got to tell me, what does any of that have to do with me? And I remember saying, I'm not exactly sure how I answered, but I remember saying to him, that is a wonderful question. I want you to hang on to that question as the years pass. Because there are a couple of things you need to know when you read the Bible. One is, what did it really say? You can't just pick a verse out and say, here's what God said. No, you always have to know who wrote it, when did they write it, to whom did they write it, for what reason did they write it. It's called exegesis. You need to know that. But once you get that, you got to step over into the other world, listen with the other ear, and ask that question, what does this say to me? I always tell my preaching students down at Duke, in every sermon, for the rest of your life, there's going to come a time as you're preaching for the congregation called the so what moment. They're not going to say it out loud, but they're going to say it. They're going to say, so what? So what does anything you're saying, what does anything you've said so far have to do with me? Same question that young man asked. And if you haven't asked it yet this morning, it's a good time to. This famous lesson from Isaiah, uh, when you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. This equally famous passage from Hebrews, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. Therefore, let us run with perseverance the race set before us, looking to Jesus. Familiar words, religious words, biblical words, hurt them all your lives. By this point, you should be saying, so what? So what do they have to do with me in 2021 in Delray Beach, in my life, in my world? Years ago, well, uh, almost 20 years ago, I suppose, I received a phone call one morning uh, from another staff member in the church I was serving. And she said, you need to go and tell me the home. There's a tragedy and you need to be there. And so I got in my car and drove over to that house. It was the home of a delightful couple, a man in his late 40s, his wife in her mid 40s. They had two children, a young girl, early, early teens, and another little thing who uh, was too young even to know what was going on. Father had left early week. I'll be back Friday, got a soccer match kissed his wife and children goodbye, and that was the last they saw him. He was healthy. He was fine. He died before the week was over. I got there, and there was a little child who didn't know what was going on, but knew it wasn't good. There was another child in the absolute shock that happens when you lose your dad and you're just a kid. Um, the wife's parents and Siblings were there, a handful of neighbors. She understandably hit by the absolute unexpected shock of this announcement, had, had emotionally collapsed, was there in bed. And that began for us a journey from this abject pain to a place that psychologists call new normal. Uh, over a year later, I, I was able to witness that wife and that family finally arrived. You don't, you don't get over, you know, if you've lost someone. You don't say after a month or two or five or six, well, I'm fine now, it's all done. Forget about that and move ahead. That doesn't happen. But you still move ahead into life. You learn to live again and laugh again and love again and be again. And I watched it happen. I remember, I remember at some point saying, uh, what was most important to you when you made the journey. What was most important getting from where you were to where you are now? Assuming, of course, that she was uh, spiritually sensitive and intelligent enough to say, well, it was all about you, Michael. Uh, your, your brilliance, your, your pastoral care for me, without that I would never have made it, but th surprise, that's not what came out of her mouth. 
what was the secret? What got you from there to here? And she said, well, a lot of things. My family's been supportive. Uh, I have a certain number of friends who surrounded me. Uh, you, other people from the church have helped. And then she mentioned a woman's name. She said she's just been um, indispensable. And I said, oh, really? I, I didn't know that you folks were friends. And she said, we weren't. I said, you weren't? No, no. I guess we were sort of minimally acquaintances. I knew who she was. She knew who I was. We had never gone out together. We didn't see each other socially. It was, but, but one morning, there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and there she stood. Unexpectedly, as I said, we weren't friends. And she said, do you have a little time? And I said, you know, nowadays, it seems like that's all I have. She came in, I put on some coffee, we sat, we talked, and, and she said, I learned, I, di I didn't really know her, I learned her story that I had not known before. I just knew her now with her, her grown children and her husband. But 15 years before, she had been exactly where I was. Uh, they had three children, she and her first husband. And one morning he came and he kissed me and said, I'll see you this evening. We were going to go to our favorite restaurant. He left. Before he reached work, he was in a horrific accident, uh, DOA. When they got him to the emergency room, it was too late. She told this church member of mine her story, and she said, it was terrible. It was two steps forward and one step back, and sometimes I felt like I couldn't take a step at all, and I can't survive the pain I'm going through. But I did. <clears throat> and look at me now. I'm alive again. I am here <clears throat> with you. I made it through, and so will you. So she said, here's what I want. I want every time you see me, wherever it is, downtown, in the grocery store, driving down the street, whenever you see me, I want you to say to yourself, she has been where I am. She made it through, and so will I. And she said after that, once a week, the woman came to her home, once a week. And she said sometimes, we would always put on coffee, sometimes we'd sit in the kitchen and we would talk about grief and pain and suffering and loss and the children and finances. But sometimes we'd talk about the weather and school and fashion and sports and what was in the morning news. It depended on the mood of the day. But every time... Every time, she said, when she would stand to leave, she'd walk to the door, turn back toward me and say, look at me. What do you see? And I would say, I see somebody who has been where I am. You made it through and so will I. She said, Michael, that woman saved my life. The first word I said, hang the letter P in your head, is prayer. Prayer. When you are going through the valley of the shadow, whatever that means to you, when you are crossing through the deep waters, as we read in Isaiah, there will come moments when you will cry out, as a friend of mine wrote in a book of his, in, in the dark night of the soul. You will cry out like Job did. This is not right. This is not fair. I shouldn't be going through this. This is greater pain than I can carry. How am I going to survive? And the being on the other end, the listening into that prayer, will not be some misty spirit on the edge of the universe who has no idea what it means to be human. Instead, it will be someone who says, I get it. I know what you're going through. I've been there myself. Oh, no, it's just a toddler. My parents had to lift me up under the dark of night and escape Israel and go into Egypt where we were immigrants because the leader of our country was seeking to exterminate me. And I was just a little child. He was trying to murder me. And later I remember when I went and, and preached my first sermon in my hometown of my home church, just the little village of Nazareth. And, and there they were gathered in the synagogue, friends of mine, people I'd grown up with, relatives, people I'd known all my life. And I didn't even preach to them. I didn't even say, here are my ideas. I just opened up their Bible and I read it to them. 
But the Bible was so offensive to them that these folks I had known forever wanted to kill me. I remember what it was like toward the end of my ministry to be homeless and jobless and not even to own a change of clothes. I remember what it was like to be betrayed by a friend whom I loved and trusted. I remember what it was like to be nailed to a cross by the very people I came to save. Yeah. When you cry out in the darkness, Jesus, why? How will I survive? You listen, you hear a voice. I get it. I know what you're going through. I've been there myself. But if we listen a bit more, that voice says, and after the cross, three days later, there was Easter. Look at me, he says. Look at me. I made it through. And you will too. For the joy that was set before him, meaning to give us a way to make it through. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Therefore, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Who walked through the valley of the shadow, who walked through the deep waters, and who says, look at me. I made it. You will too. Part of the power of prayer. But then there's this other P word, people. Sometimes the strength that Christ provides to us when we have no strength is through other people whom he sends our way. I grew up as an only child, and my mother died 17 years before my dad did. And I remember when dad died, uh, he was, it wasn't just losing my father, it was losing my best friend, it was losing the man who had been my hero, quite literally, throughout my life. Um, and I was a pastor of a 4,000 member church and I preached about faith and grace and strength and I helped people, you know, who were making it through the deep waters. But all of a sudden, the wind was taken out of me. The legs were cut out from beneath me. I, just, I was staggering. And I went to lunch one day with a member of, of my church who, like me, had, and like all of us, after you reach a certain age, he had lost both of his parents. And, and he knew I was struggling with this. And he said to me, <clears throat> Michael, how do you feel in a word, one word? I remember saying, well, I feel like, well, it's, it's, it's sort of like being, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it, I, I feel kind of like, and like this, he said, you feel like an orphan. I said, yeah. That's the word. I couldn't find the right word. You know the word. I feel, I feel like an orphan. And I suddenly felt this immense sense of comfort. It wasn't that uh, the event was changed. My father was still deceased. It wasn't that the grief vanished away. But suddenly, seated right with me was someone who had been through exactly the same situation and understood precisely how it feels. And I was able to look at him and say, yeah, he has walked where I walk. He has been where I am. And he made it through. So will I. It was as if he were saying, look at me. Look at me. What do you see? Sometimes, uh, and I know that you'll find this incredibly hard to believe, and that's okay, I get it. But sometimes when God sends that person 
to help you through the valley of the shadow, through the deep waters. And it's part of incarnation. You know, this, the faith becomes flesh. Sometimes that person, I, I know, I know you won't believe it. It can even be a pastor. It can, I have seen it happen. It can be Doug, it can be Greg, it can even be me. It can be, which is why Henry Nouwen wrote that marvelous book to pastors uh, called The Wounded Healer. And in that book he said, sometimes the greatest tool we have at our disposal to help you through the deep waters is the pain that we have experienced in the past. The wounds and the weariness and the worry. The dark nights of the soul. Now and said, it is almost impossible to lead someone who is lost in the desert wilderness back to wholeness if you've never been in the wilderness and found the road out. All of this simply to say, Whatever you're going through, and some of you are going through stuff right now, and I know that, and you know that, and you may have it pretty well hidden away, but it's there financially, family estrangements, physical illnesses, um, pains and problems that nobody but you know. There's somebody. There's somebody who's out there who will let you lean on them if you just let them know you need to. People. Let me mention this third thing. There, there, there's prayer to one who says, I've been there, look at me. I was on a cross, but Easter came. Your Easter's coming, you'll make it through as well. There are people that God sends our way. But before you make it through, while you're still in the deep waters, when you're still in the valley of the shadow, when life is still tough, when you're still struggling with whatever it is you're struggling with right now. Edgar Jackson says 90% of the people who come into church on Sunday mornings are carrying a burden with them. Arthur Caliandro used to say to me, I am committed, I am convinced that when I stand up to preach, everybody who came through the door of the church into the sanctuary is broken in some fashion, hoping to be made whole. When that's you, when you're still in deep waters, and some of you are right now, and you know, when that's you, there's another promise. It's the promise of presence. Prayer, people, presence. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you, for you are mine, and I love you, saith the Lord. Whatever you're facing, you don't face it alone. Years and years ago, I served a beautiful, large, happy, uh, active church up in the mountains of North Carolina, and on our personnel committee, uh, was a woman named Jane. Uh, Jane and Jim, her husband, were great, great people. I got to know them, loved them, enjoyed being around them. Uh, Jane was a shaker and mover in the real estate industry, and she was absolutely brilliant. When you were with her in any kind of a meeting, you know, we knew that in all likelihood, she's the smartest person in the room. Just not much doubt about that. Uh, she was on our, our personnel committee, which in Methodist circles is called staff parish relations. Jane's brilliance was often uh, disguised just a little bit till you got to know her by the depth of her southern accent. Next to Jane, I sounded like I come from the Bronx. And uh, it was thick. You get to know her and you realize, oh, okay, forget the accent. This is, this is a deep B. But, but she sounded. And... Uh, on this particular committee, whenever there was a, a, a conflict or a crisis in the church, she knew that I just totally freaked out because I didn't want conflict. I don't know how you are, you are dug by, to me, you know, this is the body of Christ and you can't have the hand punching itself in the nose. You gotta, you just, we gotta have peace and unity and it, it would drive me just nuts. And Jane would come to me every time 
and she'd say, Preacher, I thought I had told you something apparently you forgot. I think I'm going to have to tell you again. And uh, I knew what was coming. She'd say, You know, when my children were growing up and they went through a bad time, I would always say to them, this will get better or it'll get over. (laughs) And I thought, yeah, you're right. You don't stay in the valley of the shadow forever. You're not in the deep waters forever. You pass through. It will get better. Or if not, it will be resolved. It'll get over. I always tell them it'll get better or it'll get over. And in the meantime, I'll be right here every minute if you need me. That was biblical. That was right out of Isaiah. When you pass through the deep waters, but you're not through them yet, I will be with you. Step by step. Moment by moment. You know what Jesus promised? The last thing he said to the disciples before he ascended? Lo, I will be with you always. So before it gets better, or before it gets over, and you're in the deep waters, if you listen, you hear the whisper. They're there. You're not in this by yourself. I've been through this wasteland. I'll be with you step by step. And I know the way out. I don't know what you're carrying around this morning. I really don't. But I know that for almost every one of you, you brought some burden with you about your own life or the life of somebody you love. And sometimes it's burden enough you wonder, can I just take the next step? That's when, that's when we have an answer to the young man who says, Doc, what does any of this have to do with me? I thought maybe nothing at the moment, but if you live long enough, son, you'll get there. And here's what it has to do with you. When you pray in the dark night of the soul, somebody is listening who says, I get it. I've been there. Look at me. My Easter came. And yours will too. Sometimes he sends somebody else to sit across the table just to say, hey, I know what you're feeling. Let me be your strength. And before that even happens, when you're in the worst of it, there's somebody standing beside you that says, when you pass through these deep waters, I'll be with you because you're mine. And I love you, saith the Lord. When we're caught in the dark, night of the soul if we remember those three promises we'll survive until the daylight comes please receive the benediction may Jesus who has walked where you walk and who has experienced his own cross, walk with you until your own Easter comes and your darkness turns to light. May his spirit be with you day by day and step by step, giving you power, giving you peace and giving you love. Amen. Amen.